Thanks, Christina. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be here uh, remotely. Um, so this talk is about SMATCH, uh, which is a static analysis tool that I wrote. Um, I think the last, I think there, you're in a series of static analysis tools. Um, and the last one that uh, talk that was, was Julia's talk about Cox now. Um, so this is just um, a brief introduction to SMATCH, uh, some things about the Linux kernel and um, some ideas for different, different uses that you could put static analysis to. Um, so anyways, let me start with the slides. That's, that's so if you, if uh, you could download Smash while I'm talking, there's a get clone um, URL there. And then you'll need to install some libraries. Um, that is the instruction for Debian. Um, it's going to be similar on Red Hat, um, but they might have a different name for their um, SQLi library. Um, but you could you could start on that while I'm talking because uh, the first part is not really about um, code. It's just my biography. So this is me growing up. I'm on I'm on the far uh, left in boarding school in Africa. Um, and then after I left Africa, I went to uh, college. This is me in um, Minnesota. And, uh, but I always felt like I would come back to Africa. I always wanted to. So after I finished university in Minnesota, that's not actually me. Uh, then, um, that's when I graduated from college at, uh, that's the dot-com collapse and there are no jobs. So I was unemployed for a bit. And I, I wrote Smash um, initially, right after college, I wrote a, a version of Smash, which um, was terrible. Uh, it, it, uh, what it did was, it took C code and then it um, outputted something that I could grab. Because <laughs> um, what I realized was that part of the problem in um, finding bugs is finding the actual code. So if you can just grab for it, then um, that simplifies um, finding bugs. And my first check that I wrote was looking for locking bugs. And, um, it said, oh, if we come across a, um, that time Linux was very old. This was of course 20 years ago and there was a lot, big kernel lock. And if you take the big kernel lock then it incremented the lock count by one. And if you um, decrement the, the, um, the big kernel lock, then uh, decremented that. And then at the end of the function it's like, oh, are we in an odd number or an even number? And uh, to the uh, Arab um, But I got a job. I stopped working on Smash. Then that job, I thought I was going to go out of business. Uh, but we, so then I rewrote Smash in C using not, yeah, using um, Sparse as a front end. But then the company survived, made a little bit of profit. Forget about Smash again. Uh, this is me uh, in 2009. Um, I took, I came back to Africa. I took a bunch of money from South Africa, starting in Egypt and going um, down to South Africa and then back to Zambia. Uh, I'm hearing some voices. <laughs> That's not on my end. Uh, um, unless it's a question, but I'm, I can't hear the, what the question is. Anyways, uh, so while I was cycling, uh, then I 
that's when I did a lot of the critical work on SMACs. Um, the important parts of flow analysis, I figured it out on my bike trip. Uh, I had a little laptop um, and uh, I reported the bugs to the Linux kernel mailing list and nobody did anything with it. Not one bug was fixed. So I told my brother about it and he's like, um, you should just fix it yourself. If you fix it yourself, somebody will hire you. So in, after I finished my bike trip, then I did fix a lot of bugs. This is in 2010. Um, if you look at the top uh, committers by patches, then I was number two under Joe. Uh, and um, sure enough, I was hired at Oracle after that um, because people, somebody saw me, uh, um, Chris Mason, and he's like, Let, let's, we're building out the Oracle kernel team. Let's hire, hire Dan. So then, in, that was, of course, 10 years ago. In 2020, I'm not on the list. And if you look at the list, um, and Mara is, is a repeat uh, name. A lot of these names are old names, um, but Mara has got 12,000 commits. You have to, you know, you have to be in the top three to even feature on this uh, list. Um, so it becomes a lot harder these days uh, to, I guess, um, to compete with everybody else. The competition is very fierce. So uh, why am I no longer the superstar developer? And number one, laziness. Number two is that um, I, I report about you know, over a hundred bucks. Uh, instead, of, instead of fixing them, I just report them. And it's faster for me. And people are much better at um, fixing bugs these days when you report them. And uh, it doesn't take the original author long to figure out what, what he intended. For me, I have to look at, look at it and think, you know, what's the right way to fix it? But the original author knows. And we tend to report bugs uh, right away, within a week, maybe, or days, even hours. Um, so in 2010, there was a lot of ancient bugs. Nobody was fixing static analysis uh, bugs. There was one guy uh, who fixed 30 static analysis bugs, I would say. But um, basically, it didn't happen. Um, then there's a lot of uh, uh, increased competition for easy bugs. These days, static analysis is um, very popular. Um, you know, I, I started work on Snatch in 2002, and I, I stopped working on it until like 2008. Um, and I imagined that, oh, somebody's gonna write Snatch. Somebody's gonna write a, a very good flip, um, static analysis tool, and uh, I won't be able to compete with them. And, uh, you know, I know what I want it, want it to be, but it's not, you know, somebody's gonna do it and, and take away that um, opportunity. But in 20 years, um, static analysis has not really developed that much. Smash has developed a little bit. Um, but what has happened is that the Linux kernel community does a lot of static analysis. So in 2010, I reported, I reported about 33 bugs. Um, Steven Rothwell, he, he does um, build errors. Randy is doing build errors. Um, but then in 2020, uh, you know, everything is static analysis. The Hulk robot is reporting 800 bugs. K build is here three times. So they're reporting, again, 800 bugs. Um, I'm reporting 150. Steven and Randy are doing build, build errors. 
Um, so that's a different thing. Sysbot, um, there's a runtime bugs, and but it's, again, it's an automated system. So in the Linux kernel, we love automated um, uh, re bug reports. Um, in 2010, people were skeptical of static analysis and uh, um, they complained a lot about the false positives and um, yeah, just generally there is a lot of skepticism about it. But these days, um, a lot of thousands of patches come for, from static analysis. Uh, the other two names are doing runtime and static analysis for report reporting. So there's a lot of static analysis. And of course, this is just the top 10. Um, you know, other people are looking at it and fixing here and there bugs. So everybody's doing static analysis these days. Um, we have three main static analysis tools that we use in the kernel, uh, at least open source ones. There's uh, Sparse, which is um, very high quality code. Linus Torvalds wrote it. Um, Luke is maintainer of it now, um, but Linus is still very involved. It's very fast. Um, it warns about Endian bugs and user annotations uh, when you mix user space pointers with kernel space pointers. Um, and it warns about type issues. Um, Smatch uses Sparse as a C front end. Cox now, Julia Wall presented it um, about it yes, last week. Um, it's easy to write checks in Cox now. And it works on um, the, the code before it's been pre-processed. So you can write checks for macros. You can write it, checks for macros in Smatch as well, but it's a lot more complicated. Um, and it generates patch automatically. So, I mean, that's a very valuable thing. Um, like some months ago, um, Case Cook went through the kernel and, and um, changed a lot of allocations uh, to use like KC Alec and K Malik array and um, the struct size macro. And what those changes do is they prevent uh, uh, integer overflows. So they're just a, a much safer API. Uh, if you were writing it in Smatch, um, and you reported to people, oh, this is a much safer API. Um, they don't want those wrong reports. They would get annoyed with you. They'd say, no, it, it might be safer, but in this case, we know that um, it can't overflow. But if you send them a patch, which changes everything, then they just apply it. So in that way, um, Coxnell, it makes the code a lot safer, which is just not possible with another tool. So, of course, my tool is Smatch, and it has the, the best flow analysis, certainly in open source, but I mean, probably it's the best that is there. Uh, and I'm going to explain a little bit more what that means. Um, but Smatch uh, tracks all the values of uh, all the variables. Um, of course, that's not always possible. But that's what we're trying for. Um, then it tracks uh, relationships between variables. We, um, and it also tracks, like, if we know, we try to, um, if we know A is less than B, then keep a record of that and so that we can answer questions later on. It does cross-function analysis. Uh, how that works is um, you do a build of the kernel, which spits out a lot of SQL, and then it, it builds a database, and you can look up in the database how the function's called. And so then you run Smatch again, and it uses all the information about how functions called. 
Uh, and then if you build up, if you run it again with some more info output, it will, will rebuild the database. And every time you rebuild the database, then the um, call tree extends. So you know about this is called from this function, which is called from this function, which is called from this function. Um, but unfortunately, this match has some downsides. Uh, the documentation is not very good, um, and it only works in the Linux kernel, which is not true. Uh, it uh, there's um, Joyen is using Smatch. They're they're probably the the the, uh, the other big user of it besides the Linux kernel. But um, in theory, it should work on all C code. But in real life, um, I've only tested it on the kernel. And my job is a kernel developer. So um, it's hard for me to invest a lot of time into making it work on, on things that aren't the Linux kernel. So, but it could work on anything. But right now, it's only been tested on the Linux kernel. And another thing I would say there is, um, I'm not a I'm not a user space programmer, really, and I don't know anything about like user space networking. I, I mean, I can Google that stuff, um, but I'm not an experienced networking developer in terms of user space. Uh, and there's a lot of things you would want to check there, um, but so there's different levels of working, I guess. And there's an element where I've tested on the Linux kernel and then I've written stuff to get around bugs that I had on the Linux kernel. And um, so it works really well on the Linux kernel and perhaps less well on other software. So uh, flow analysis is math to understand code. So when you're looking at code, then um, you're explaining it to your friend, then you can say, oh, if you no, know, that's not possible. That, that K3, it's not a double free on that path. You know, somebody sent me a, a patch the other day, and I'm like, um, that you think you're fixing a bug, but it's absolutely not fixing a bug. That, that code never returns um, that value. So, and the way I figure it out is a kind of logic and computers can do that same logic. That logic is flow analysis. Um, that's what that, that word means. And we could, um, so the, the, the flow analysis is pretty simple in terms of smash, which is that we track where variables come from and, and we tie them together in lists. And I think you can answer any question that way. Um, the problem is uh, sometimes there's too many variables and they can be tied together in too many ways. So then you run out of memory. Um, for example, let's say a function is called over 200 times. Um, in Smatch, uh, I think there's some kind of general thing that we, we can say, but basically you can't tie the variables together in, in a meaningful sense. So if you're trying to parse 200 different calls, it just takes too long. So instead of that, I think what happens is um, we try to pull out anything common amongst all those 200 calls and, um, and just say it's called one time like this. But of course, those are going to be vague um, details about how it's called. And I'm saying that now, trying to remember the code. Um, that's how I wish the code would work. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm not. I, I, I don't. Don't get annoyed if that's not actually how the code works. So. Um, Anyways, flow analysis lets you answer questions about the code. You know, is a, is the pointer null? Is are we holding the lock at this point? Um, is this pointer been freed? 
And sometimes those questions are complicated to answer, but uh, uh, Smash does the, the work for you in the background. Um, some things, flow analysis can answer almost any question, but some questions are, are, are too difficult. Um, sometimes people debate, is this a bug or is it a feature? Sometimes you can't tell from the code um, if it's working correctly, you need the hardware. And again, um, as I mentioned before, sometimes there's too many variables and you can't um, track everything. But uh, it's surprising how much stuff you can keep track of. Um, in the Linux kernel, um, when I'm running Smash, there's like a, a timeout to say, oh, we've been trying to parse this function for over five minutes now. Let's just give up. And then we skip to the next function. Um, I don't know if it's actually five minutes. I might have changed that. But if it's five minutes or if it's one minute, at some point you just give up. You're like, oh, oh, this, this code is too complicated. But there's 200 functions like that. And there's, a, you know, out of thousands and thousands of functions in the Linux kernel. So most things you can parse to some extent. So when you're reading the code, you can infer things from looking at it. So if you have a if statement saying if x is less than 42, you can infer that x is 0 to 41. Or if x is a signed value, it might be negative. Um, if there's a null check, that means probably the pointer can be null. So um, one warning that uh, Smash will print out is if you dereference pointer and then check it for null, and that means can it be null or can it not be null? The author thinks it can be null, um, but you already dereferenced it, so that means you think somebody else thinks it can't be null. And it's pretty important to get that correct because otherwise the kernel is going to crash. Um, and a lot of times the answer is it can't be null. So it's not really a bug, but we still think that's worth fixing um, just so the code makes sense. Uh, if you have a, a PR error, that means you have an error. Um, and um, probably it means you should return an error code. A lot of people think error codes are not that important, but um, they are. Um, for example, uh, if the user, um, if the user, if we're checking user data, then um, uh, and we don't return an error code, then it could be a security bug. Normally, if you return an error, a lot of times if you return an error code, if you don't return an error code, you return success, but you should have returned an error code. A lot of times that will result in a use after free or some kind of a crash. So it seems like a trivial thing, but actually uh, it's pretty important. This uh, code here is a famous bug from 2016, four years ago, five years ago, something like that. Um, it's heart, the heartbeat, um, heart bleed bug. And what it is, is there's a, a copy and paste error. They, they put go to fail twice. So when you're looking at this code from a static analysis point of view, um, there's, you should know that, oh, that's, um, there, there's several warnings that you look at. So um, if you wrote that code in the Linux kernel, you would get three error messages. So the next line after that extra go to fails is unreachable code, it's dead code. Um, then there's a, um, it's, it looks like it's indented. So it looks like it should be part of the if statement. 
but there's no curly braces. So that's another warning message. And then the third warning message is the go to uh, fail, the next, the, the, um, the go to fail should be indented, pulled back. So it's like the indenting is not right. That's the third uh, warning message. Another warning message that might be useful to print is to say that um, you've got two lines which are exactly the same, one after the other. And um, I've, I've looked at that to see if that's a valid warning that, that we could do. And I wasn't able to, uh, to make it work. It seemed like a good idea, but sometimes there's um, copy and paste of things like that, um, which are not bugs. And some of the code was very interesting, um, but uh, the, um, but it didn't work. So sometimes you have ideas for things that static analysis could find and it doesn't work. Um, so now uh, I'm gonna talk about how to write a Smatch check. So Smatch is based on sparse and um, in uh, there's some sparse data types that are important. There's a symbol. So each variable is a symbol. And then a symbol is inside of a, a expression. So um, there's a, if you have A equals 100, that's a, symbol expression, then a Simon expression, and a value expression. And then if you add a semicolon on the end of that, then it's a statement. So you've got symbols, which are variables, and um, expressions and statements. Those are the important data types in Sparse. Then in Smatch, um, Smatch is a kind of state engine, which means, um, you set a state and then it transitions to a different state. Um, so the, base, the most important data type is a state, which is normally just a name, like state freed. Um, and then you normally have a variable um, connected to a state to say, oh, the variable is freed. And that's an SM state struct. And you can say um, set state expression freed, which will set the variable to, to freed. And then you can, um, you can get state with the expression. And then when you have a group of states, all the states um, that are present are, are in a tree, a state tree. That's um, a tree struct. Uh, so, um, and those, the states which are in a tree are tied together. They're, they're, um, they're preserved history and you can do a lot of um, stuff with them um, to, to manipulate them. Just say, oh, assume that X equals a hundred, then what does this tree look like for that? Which states are true at that point? Um, and then in Smatch, uh, you have numbers, which are SVAL, uh, and they have a, a data type and a value. And you've got a range list, which is a range of numbers. Um, and you can, with the numbers, there's um, various levels of certainty. So you can say, get a like range list, and it might fail to say that this, I don't know which numbers this can be. Um, get absolute range list uh, doesn't fail. Um, it'll tell you, uh, it'll give you that it, it can be zero to um, UN max, depending on the time. Um, get user range list will tell you if the user can set that data and what um, the user can set it to. So there's different levels of certainty and, and um, there's, there's also a hard max and a fuzzy max, uh, different levels of math. So 
Uh, I'm going to just walk you through a sample check. So you first declare, this is a check to look for uh, freed variables. Don't use after free and double free. I guess use after free. Um, so you first declare the state, which is freed. Um, all all uh, smash checks have access to the um, global states of undefined and merged. So if you don't know what the state is, then it's undefined. And if you if you combine a um, undefined with a freed, then it becomes a merged state. Um, then you um, have to hook everything into the um, the core. So we'll say add a function hook for k free that'll call the match free function. We'll say if the state gets modified, then we'll set it to undefined. If the variable gets modified. Um, and then if the variable is dereferenced, then we'll check it. So the match free function, you take the first argument of k free and you set the state to freed. In the matched references function, then you get the SM state, which is different from the state. Um, because in this example, let's say the SM state is merged. Um, so you get this SM state and it's merged, but one of the possible values of the merged SM state is freed. So then you'll print a warning to use after free. So it's pretty simple. In some ways, um, uh, in the background, all the uh, states are um, controlled and and um, they do do a lot of flow analysis magically for you in the background to track if it's freed or not. So the checks themselves are quite simple, though. Um, so not all this, not all these match checks use that much flow analysis, and they're all quite different. But that's just an example. Um, of course, uh, a lot of people upstream use match, and I'm also checking the code every day on Linux Next. Um, so, uh, I mean, you have the Huawei people with the Hulk robot reporting 800 bugs every year. Um, so using Smatch is something that everybody's doing. Um, but what we need is people to, to take Smatch and do something new, different. Um, and so I've got a lot of ideas at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, and the simplest one, and maybe the best one, is to just take Smatch and use it on a different um, C project, your favorite one, let's say. Or um, another idea would be to run it on all of the Debian C code. Um, there is a Debian static analysis project, and I don't know how far along they are, and I don't know what they're doing, um, but that would be cool if somebody did that. Or it would be cool if somebody integrated Smash with Jenkins or one of the other continuous integration tools. In the Linux kernel, um, the Kbuild bot, the zero day bot, uses Smatch. Um, but um, that's not a, a, they haven't released the code for that. They just send the warnings out. I, I'm assuming the code for that is quite um, bad and uh, hacky because they just wanted to get the bugs out, the bug reports out. Um, so, uh, but it's a fantastically valuable service. And that's, I mean, they, they're the number one bug reporter right now. So, but if somebody else were to integrate Smatch with Jenkins, everybody would love that. Um, if you, it would be fun if somebody took Smatch and ran it on GitHub or what well, another fun product would be to take Smatch and just strip out everything um, all the cross-function analysis, uh, don't build the database, um, remove all the other checks, just only the off by ones, because that's a pretty good check. And if... 
that is not. Did somebody ask a question? Is Um, another idea would be to use Smatch uh, to create a website. I don't know, um, the Linux cross-function Elixir website, I love it. Um, but uh, it would be cool if somebody integrated that with the Smatch cross-function database. So you could see um, where a struct member is set or if it if a function is called from a function pointer, Smatch is aware of that. Um, or you could uh, see if um, anybody passed a null pointer to a function. All those things are in the cross-function database, and um, it's you know hard to access that if, if you have to rebuild your your cross-function database. Unfortunately, a lot of that information is is quite slow right now, but um, could be fixed, it's simple enough to fix. Um, this one is quite, is very, very difficult, would be, which would be to integrate Smatch with a code editor. So you could parse um, a function up to where you, uh, a file up to where you're, you've done. So with C, you could read part of the file and then stop. Um, you don't have to have a fully uh, fully finished file to, um, to run Smatch on it. Um, another idea is to integrate Smatch with Syscaller. There was some students who did something like this. Well, they did this in a way. Um, what they did was they looked at system calls which modified um, different struct numbers. So they called us, they took a system call, they looked at Smash to say, which struct members does this modify? Then um, if they had two sys system calls which modify the same struct member, then they tried to race them against each other. And they were able to find um, like 10 race conditions with, with that process. And then they wrote their thesis and uh, disappeared. But the code is still there uh, in Smatch. And um, I think it's a useful thing. Potentially, there's other uh, useful things like that. Um, of course, uh, this one is number four is very difficult, which is to just rewrite Smatch, but uh, with uh, Clang front end. What that would give you would it be? You could test C plus plus code. I think I don't know. Um, when I was writing Smash, Clang was not there, and Sparse was. And I love Sparse, and um, I'm probably not going to make that work. I'm not a C plus plus programmer, but. Somebody else could copy Smatch pretty easily, I think. Um, copy the data types, copy the, 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 the tree manipulation uh, code. Um, and it'd be, a, I think, a, a very useful tool. Unfortunately, I think it was hard for me to sell anybody on static analysis. When I was developing Smatch, um, nobody really wanted to, to fund that. Um, they wanted to fund kernel developers. So that's what my job is. But, you know, other people might have different luck. Uh, these are much simpler and much better ideas, probably. Uh, you could just take a, a check from Coxnell and rewrite it in Smash. Um, I... Uh, of course, we, uh, Julia and I, I, we borrow ideas from each other um, at times. Uh, it's not polite to, to uh, do it too quickly. <laughs> you should wait for them to, for, to get all their bug fixes in. But um, when you rewrite it, then just because the code works differently and you, you're going to try a different trick, and you're going to end up finding different bugs. And also, if two tools generate a warning, I mean, that's fantastic. 
people look at it like maybe that's annoying. It's not annoying. It's fantastic. Um, and that means that two people will email um, the original author about it. And that good. Um, if you're on the uh, any development lists, and whenever you see review comments, um, think about how that could be translated into a SMAT check. Um, I have avoided uh, putting style checks into SMAT. Um, but I think I will add a, a pedantic option, which is only for reviewing new code. Um, so for example, uh, Julia recently went through and changed all the um, statements that use a comma instead of a semicolon. And I had had that check for a long time, but I hadn't found any real bugs with it. So um, I hadn't committed that check, but it's a good idea to do it for the pedantic option. Uh, one thing I do is I look through the last RC releases, and I just think about if any of them can be translated into a check. A lot of them are hardware specific, or it's like, is this a bug? Is this a feature? It's not clear. Um, some of them are build errors, a lot of build errors. Um, but occasionally you'll find uh, simple bugs in it, and those should be static analysis. They should be figured out immediately. And I also review CVEs to see how, how good we're doing at, at fixing CVEs, preventing them in the future. Um, this one maybe not a great idea, but I used to have a, a scheduling in Atomic warning. So if you're holding a spin lock, you can't um, call kmalloc with GFD kernel, or you can't call schedule. Um, or you can't, I don't think you, you can't take a mutex either, I don't think. Um, uh, I used to have that check, and I think it's there in, in um, Foxnell, but I don't think it's great. And I deleted my check somewhere along the line, and uh, I tried to re-implement it in a, you know, in a cross-function way, and I just didn't figure it out. And, and um, I don't know, it might be a good idea. Uh, this is a good idea. When you, if you take user data, and then um, you save it as a enum. enum. So um, I don't know. I don't know if there's a way in sparse to figure out the highest value an enum can be, um, but it should be capped at something, probably. And uh, so Smatch has two ways of tracking um, capped data. There's to say that it's capped to unknown data and to say that it's capped to like 43. But enum should be capped at a literal like 43, I think. So if somebody could do that. They might find a lot of um, security vulnerabilities or they might find nothing, I don't know. Um, if you take uh, memory, which is allocated to, to uh, with kmalloc and pass it to devmkfree, somebody did that today. It's an example from today. Uh, if you're checking is error p uh, or is error value p, is error value, uh, somebody was doing that today. Um, and, but you already know the results. Maybe that's a good warning. Um, or if you have an if condition and you know the results already. And um, sometimes uh, that will just be the last, it, there's a lot of series of if else statements. If this, then else if, do this. Else if, um, and then the last one will be guaranteed to be true. Um, but if there's like dead code, then maybe that's useful. I, I, I have played with this one and I've never actually made it to work. Um, this is Julia Lawal's comma one. So I had written this comma um, 
in C, you can replace almost every semicolon with a comma and it won't break. Um, and so I, what happened is, is people cut and paste and um, they, from the initializer and it becomes code and then they forget to switch the semicolon, the comma to the semicolon. Um, uh, I had never found any bugs, but Julia just swapped them all and she did find bugs where uh, it was supposed to be not part of the if statement, but because it ends in a comma, it is part of the if statement. Some people do that and they'll put the second prop on the same line, which is terrible, terrible, you know, style, terrible, everything. Uh, but uh, if it's indented back, then um, that's probably a bug. So Dan, um, if I can ask a question, uh, sure. what would, um, based on your experience, I was just doing a uh, kernel uh, git log and uh, grepping for a smash. I know it's not, it doesn't always, uh, we have about 571 bugs fixed uh, that are found by smash. What uh, kind of bugs would you, um, your top writer bugs that smash would find in terms of, I am seeing some dereferencing um, before the null check um, uh, kind of uh, uh, pointer type errors. Is that, is that something um, Smatch would be useful for, for the, in, in, your, in your estimation? Um, of course, we have that check mm -hmm. to say that you're referencing before the, the, the check. Right. Um, the, uh, you're asking which is the most common bug? Right, right. Which is the most common bug? Um, uh, I have a two-part question. Which is the most common bug um, the Smash has found uh, that in your experience? And then also, uh, what's the best time you would say uh, to run Smash on, uh, on if somebody is writing a new driver or a new um, substantial feature, when would be a good time to run it? Um, Okay, the most common bug that I see these days is uninitialized variables. Um, <laughs> Linus got annoyed with the, with the uninitialized variable check because GCC has had um, a series of bugs. And so um, there's a lot of things where it was checking this version of GCC had the warning and this version did not have the warning. And so he just got annoyed like four months ago and disabled all that. So you have to say W equals one or yeah, W equals one to see those warnings. Um, and um, not many people do that uh, because it's just overwhelming the, the number of warnings you get. And so I am seeing tons and tons of uninitialized variable warnings. Um, and I, I wish I weren't. But, um, the, the uninitialized variable warnings are, are hard to uh, determine if they're false positives or not, because um, if you have a loop uh, which has a uh, for i is less than a limit and the limit is unknown, Match will say, well, what about if the limit is zero? And quite often the author will know, oh, in this code, we always have uh, uh, this list is never empty or, and you know, it might have continue statements in it, right? You go through a list and it's got a continue statement and me as a stranger coming in, I'm like, I don't know if the list can be empty. I don't know if the continue statements, we could hit them all the time. Um, so I sometimes don't report those. Um, but then there's a lot of straight up bugs where you, you reference a pointer before it's initialized. Right. Um, yeah, so that's my number one source of bugs right now. Um, Thank you. We do have a hand up uh, for the question. Um, uh, um, go ahead and unmute and then ask the question or just type it in the, um, type it in, in the chat. Is it a question? Um, I see a hand up, so I'm looking to see if they can ask I the question. Your other, 
Um, you were, uh, I, I run Smash after every, every patch I send. Oh, okay. So pretty much every uh, uh, patch that um, is uh, you recommend running. Yeah. Okay. Um, the you know uh, most of the maintainers uh, um, rely on me to some extent, right? They're like ah, or in KBell, they know that somebody's going to warn them about static analysis. They know there's a bunch of people who will warn you if you if you have a static analysis thing. So a lot of the maintainers don't run run Smash. Some of them do, but as somebody sending code, I run it on every patch. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, I I, I run them, uh, but I haven't. I don't. I have to admit, I don't consistently run it. But it when uh, Smash reports come up, um, which happen. Bots run them and send them. And I go, oh, I wish I had. So that's that's a good tip to uh, to to remember to run Smash. Yeah, of course I have a um, a QC script that I run on every patch. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank. Um, let me just finish this slide. I think it's the last one. It oh, is okay. the last one. Okay. Uh, so. Today, uh, there was somebody with a uh, scanf and they wrote this code here. And so um, I generated three checks based on this code, uh, which is scanf doesn't return error codes, it returns positive values. Um, and so you shouldn't return the return value from scanf. And then the um, I wrote a check. I don't know if it'll work to say, oh, if scanf didn't return what you expected it, probably we should return an error. Um, and then the final one is um, the buffer in this code was twice as big as the first part. So it can actually lead to a, a buffer overflow. It turns out if you just grab for scanf, there's not that common uh, to copy a string. But I've, I've tried to write this check before and got discouraged. But today, what I did is I just said, if it starts with um, a percent %s, the format string, then check buff and the first part and warn if buff is larger, which would have caught. It's a very simple rule, and it will miss a lot of bugs or it'll miss some bugs. But it would have caught today's bug. And so it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, it doesn't have to be smart. Just catching, um, you know, it's useful, even if it's not 100%. So, yeah, that's my advice is don't try to be fancy. Um, just catch the bug that, that somebody wrote. Probably somebody else will write it soon. That's the last slide. So, uh, um, uh, if, if um, the... Let me let me exit out of here. All right, am I on mute? We can hear you, Dan. It's fine. All right, good. So just a reminder to everyone, if you do have a question for Dan, um, feel free to raise your hand and then we can unmute you and you are welcome to um, ask your question live. If you prefer to type your question, you can see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and you can type your question and we'll be happy to answer it live as well. I have another question, Dan. Um, uh, in the last couple of the, uh, couple of days, I was debugging a problem um, that uh, is a a routine that should be called with with a RCU read lock held. Um, it and there are places it wasn't, and that was the bug. I sent up a patch. Is there is it um, can smash or um, uh, Coxnell? Uh, be used to detect such bugs? Um, yes, absolutely. 
Um, I recent, uh, no, uh, I haven't pushed this code yet. Um, uh, the question is, there's, there's, um, the question is, how do I know which functions need to be called, need, assume RCU is, is called, is, is held. And so Smash is tracking RCU, it's tracking that we're holding an RCU log. Um, but I don't use that information at this time, I, uh, in the published code. Um, so I guess that's my question to you is how do I find out if, if I need to be holding the RCU log? Right. I am coming from a different angle. I'm, I'm, I am actually looking, I have been, I have, I have had to go through code and then figure out, okay, what are all the places, what are the routines? The only giveaway for me is a, a comment block at the top saying it should be held. And then I went and scanned the code manually for all the instances, it's not being held. So I don't know the easy answer to it. Um, there are places you have, you can run with a lot depth on in for some uh, some cases, locked up warnings, but that would be a uh, during a, a debug session that you would uh, enable locked up locked up warnings and then find places. So I I'm wondering is that a static analysis type application or is it not possible? Um, no, let me say that I, I'm going to push this code soon, mm -hmm. um, and then if you have this match. Uh, database, right? Then you can just run FMDB in the function name, and I'll tell you if the RCU is held. Okay. RCU read log. Okay. Great. I think so. Okay. I mean, I if you have a um, version, uh, if you can give that to me, I'll, you know, I, I can experiment with it. Definitely. Okay, sure. I, I, I'll probably just push it. Why not? Um, uh, that code seems like it's basically working. Okay. Looks like we have a couple of questions. One is on the Q&A box uh, from Norbert. How, how do I generate a smatch report for a patch? Run smatch, store the output, apply the change, run smatch again, and perform, perform a diff. No, I mean, you just uh, run smatch in the final, uh, the final. After you finish your patch, then you run smatch in the file with the K checker script. So in the smatch scripts directory, there's a K checker script. And generally, if you uh, give it a .c file from the kernel, it will um, check that file. Okay. And Lucas, uh, you have a question. Uh, do you, would you like to ask the question? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, I can great. Hear. Okay, great. Um, then I have a question on Similar to what Shua, I think, pointed out, um, is there a possibility of adding more annotations that your analysis can get better? So let's take a couple of um, examples. Um, so you lo check for locking and unlocking um, if they match each other, right, with, um, with your yes. analysis. Sure. But of course, um, when I look at the code, I can see that immediately before or after a lock definition, there's usually a global variable that is protected by that lock. Now, sure. your analysis does not take into account, is that data accessed um, without having the lock taken? Right, so all yeah. these bugs you're kind of blind um, for. Sure. So could yeah. I now uh, add an annotation saying, well, this has to be guarded by, um, this access to that global variable has to be guarded by this lock and you could kind of extend your check. Um, how difficult um, would, be, would that be to implement and, and to kind of add annotations of that kind? Um, of course, you know, you can't know until you try. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I think that's a useful annotation. The Linux kernel has a lot of annotations to do with locking. And in my experience, I didn't need them. Um, but what you're saying is to say that this variable is protected by this lock. Um, that would be uh, quite useful. Part of the issue there is that like in probe, then you don't need to take a lock um, because it's not exported or whatever. Um, so you're gonna get false positives on that probably. Uh, but I feel like that's a useful annotation. Um, in general, I haven't found, you know, many annotations that useful. Uh, most things you can figure out just from looking at the code, but that's one thing that I can't figure out. Right? I don't think humans can figure out that generally, unless you have, unless you're a lot smarter than me. Um, so computers can't figure that out either. To say which, you know, we have a comment check patch will complain if the lock doesn't say what it's protecting. Um, the other annotation that would be quite useful maybe is to say uh, what returns are possible. That's one thing in Smatch, I hard code a bunch of those. I've got a special file, which is called return fixes. And uh, I, I hard code some returns in there to say um, this always returns um, negative values or whatever and success. Um, but other than that, I can't think of many annotations that I need. But yeah, that sounds like a useful one. And I think it'd be easy to use it if it existed. But how to make it, it's not necessarily very clear. How to, you know, how, how to actually implement it. Yeah. And, and, and maybe, so something that I always came across was, um, that I know there's a, when I look at the code, I know there's a relationship between the, the return code of a function and a certain property on, let's say input arguments, right? Um, if, if a function returns zero, I know a certain value will be initialized. And sure. That's there in the you, does your does your program automatically yeah uh, guess yeah. such sure. such um, relations um it saves uh, you try to save everything um yeah you try to save everything so it saves mm -hmm. that um to some extent because sometimes if you get over like three thousand variables change and it'll be like okay we're just gonna say it's called and um, give, forget about it. So, um, but for most functions that works, yeah. Okay, and, and would, it help, would it help you if the programmers would provide kind of, let's say empty kind of templates of what kind of relations they're looking for that you would store those and no. get your analysis no, more precise yeah. yeah i'm gonna save everything um okay the speaking of annotations i mean if we had the locking annotation i don't mind if you if you if we had to run a perl script um and get those if it was like in the comments or whatever and you could run mm -hmm. a perl script those connections um but um yeah, anyways, I, I think that might work. Okay, yeah, thanks. Hi, this is Norbert. Um, hey. If I run if I run a smidge multiple times, like let's say I have my what you said earlier, I want to generate a report and then I also want the propagation state to be as precise as possible. I would rerun a smidge multiple times, right? Um, no, I wouldn't bother with that. What, what, but what I would do is um, what I'm doing is every day I download Linux next and I rebuild the database. So after a week, it's it's filled up and it takes a long time to build the database in the kernel i've got a quad core with a lot of memory it's not you know whatever it's got hyper threading so it's like eight cpus i guess um and it takes me 
I mean, most of the day to build Linux Next. Um, if, if I, my other system's bigger and it's supposed to, it died. Um, I'm waiting for parts. Uh, so, but anyways, I don't care. As long as it finishes, uh, you know, within a day, that works for me for Linux Next. Um, the, um, yeah, so that's what I do. Is I, I rebuild my data every day, and then after a week, I've got um, a full database, I guess. Um, but it's not like I would wait for, you know, rebuild it, whatever, uh, seven times or seven days, you know, about that. this one at once. Sure. Okay. So it, it, let's assume I have a box that has 72 cores, so it's much faster, right? Um, yeah. So I could actually spend that time to do that precision thing. Um, is when I also run the build concurrently, so I like compile elements in parallel, is the outcome of as much um, deterministic? Or do you expect that if I like on two different days on the same no. Linux, but I would get? Not, it's not deterministic. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, of course, yeah. Uh, Depends on the data, what data you have in the database. And uh, um, then, you know, some of those things are time based to say that, oh, we've been parsing this function for whatever. I don't remember exactly the time, it might be a minute or five minutes. You can say, no, I'm done with the function, let's move. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not deterministic. Um, yeah, and even though you have 72 cores, uh, the database is like 24 gigs, and it, so it starts out as several, as two 12 gig files, and then you read them one at a time and create a big 24 gig. That's my database. I don't actually know what it would be in the release version, but it's probably the same, and so it takes forever. Yeah. Okay. Do you? Not, can you envision? Just just okay. don't even just do it. Once we'll give you a good idea, you know, you can look up all the information you want about it, about how functions are called. So, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating that it's not deterministic, but it absolutely is not. And then, of course, I'm changing mine every day, so I cannot reproduce bugs ever. I see. Thanks. So, um, I, I think we're almost out of time. Yes. Is there a final question which just sums up everything? We don't have, sure. we don't, yeah, we don't have any questions. I'm sorry, uh, Dan? Good. I don't see any questions actually in the chat or I'm just scanning one more time. Is there any last minute questions? So uh, uh, let me just say that I, I, I wish people would look at um, the review comments and say, always ask themselves, can we just prevent this in the future? And I'm gonna add that pedantic option so that people can add like questions and um, uh, um, so that like some things are very subtle, but there's a lot of things you could be checking that were not. So just today, I, I found so many things. Um, keep your eyes open. Find um, new chances to, to write checks. All right. Well, thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Dan, for your time. Um, just a reminder to everyone that this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.